Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome this evening, in particular, our distinguished guest and speaker, the Honourable John G. Roberts, Jr., his wife, Jane Roberts, uh, their children, Jack and Josephine, who are here this evening. The university extends again a warm welcome to the Roberts family. Um, it's an honour for the law school to have you back, sir. Thank you for being here. The James Merrills Fellowship in Law was established by friends and colleagues of Jim Merrills to acknowledge the contribution that he made to the legal profession in Australia. The fellowship provides funding for an annual visiting fellow to Melbourne Law School by a highly regarded professor, lawyer or judge from abroad. Um, Jim Merrills was the editor of the Commonwealth Law Reports for a remarkable 47 years. And for about 10 years before he became editor, Jim was a reporter for the Commonwealth Law Reports. Jim's period of service as editor and reporter extended to about half the period since the establishment of the High Court of Australia. At the time of his death last year, he was a barrister in active practice at the Victorian Bar, having been admitted to practice in 1960. When John Roberts conducted his series of seminars on the Supreme Court of the United States in 2010, Jim Merrills was an attentive attendee. Um, I observed um, over many years that Jim was a man of settled habits, and that included each morning catching a train from Box Hill after the rush of peak hour to bring him to the chambers between about 9.30 and 10 in the morning. That was early enough for court, but not early enough for the Chief Justice's seminars. <laughs> Thus it happened that Jim forsook family and took up residence at the Melbourne Club for the week of the seminars. <laughs> so there was no risk that he'd miss a word. May I say a few words of introduction of the Chief Justice before I invite him and Carolyn Evans to begin tonight's conversation. John G. Roberts, Jr., Chief Justice of the United States of America, was born in Buffalo, New York, on the 27th of January, 1955. He married Jane Marie Sullivan in 1996, and they have two children, Josephine and Jack. He received um, a Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard College in 1976, and a Juris Doctor from Harvard Law School in 1979. He served as a law clerk for Judge Henry J. Friendly of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit from 1979 to 1980 and in the same office for the then Associate Justice Rehnquist of the Supreme Court during 1980. He was Special Assistant to the Attorney General, the United States Department of Justice in 1981-1982 Associate Counsel to President Ronald Reagan, White House Counsel's Office, 1982 to 1986, and Principal Deputy Solicitor General, US Department of Justice from 1989 to 1993. From 1986 to 1989, and then from 93 to 2003, he practiced law in Washington, DC. John Roberts was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in 2003. President George W. Bush nominated him as Chief Justice of the United States of America and he took his seat on the 29th of September 2005. We're very grateful to the Roberts family and to you, sir, for agreeing to speak this evening. And at the end of the conversation, the Chief Justice will take some questions uh, from the audience uh, mediated by Professor Evans. Please welcome the Honourable John G. Roberts and Professor Carolyn Evans. So let me join with the Chancellor in welcoming you all here tonight and a particularly warm welcome to you, Chief Justice, and thank you for all you've been doing here over the last week. 
Well, thank you, and in particular, thank you for the hospitality that you've extended uh, to me and my family and to uh, Professor Lazarus. Uh, uh, the seminar uh, was uh, very invigorating. It was uh, great fun for us. It's a very engaging group you had uh, assembled, and uh, I'm just delighted to be back. Well, it was great fun for all of us who were there in the seminar as well, which for those of you uh, who didn't have that good fortune trace the history of the United States Supreme Court, both through its chief justices. Uh, and we missed one right at the end, uh, yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, we had but, to stop her. <laughs> uh, and also through its great advocates. Uh, and you, of course, are now in this wonderful position of being chief justice of the United States. But take us back to the start. When did you first decide that you might be interested in law and what motivated you? Um, I think it was about halfway through the first year of law school uh, that I... <laughs> Actually, uh, true. I um, had always thought through college uh, that I would pursue a, a career as an academic in history. That's what I was most interested in. Uh, it turns out that was a very bad uh, career uh, choice. Uh, at the time, there were very few positions open. Uh, and so I looked around for something that I thought would be like uh, history, but also have the prospect of employment. Uh, and uh, it seemed to me that law was a good good choice. It wasn't until I was in law school that I found out that I really did enjoy uh, that discipline and uh, history was left behind. But was it completely left behind or do you find that the studies that you did in history and, and the broader education in arts was something that still helped you along the way as a lawyer and as a judge? No, you're, you're, you're quite right. Uh, one reason I think I found the law so, so uh, engaging was that it did have a very heavy dose of history. I mean, you talk about the progression of particular legal doctrines and under the, the American system, you do need to know, have a good sense about the founding generation to be able to interpret the, uh, the written constitution. Uh, so that part of it appealed to me very much. But I, I found I liked sort of the added rigor of uh, uh, having actual cases, particular clients and interests involved, uh, that, that uh, made it additionally attractive to me. So, so tell us a little bit about law school. Harvard Law School is, is legendary around the world. What, what were some of the memories that you have of that time? Well, I, I think as with most uh, law students, uh, you remember particular teachers that uh, made a, a deep impression on you. Um, I certainly had uh, one. It was one of the first year teachers in, the, in contracts. It, it didn't have much to do with the subject. It's just that he was a very dynamic teacher. He taught the old uh, Socratic method. It was all you know, questions, probing questions, answers, dialogue back and forth. Um, that wasn't prevalent at Harvard Law School at the time. I think people were moving away from that to more of a lecture uh, format. Um, and, uh, but he was one of the holdovers, I guess, that still taught the Socratic method. And I found it uh, exhilarating. It was very engaging. Well, so, well, some of our students were exhilarated uh, this week when they discovered that the Socratic method was going to be used in the seminars as well, <laughs> particularly the very first student who was targeted. <laughs> Well, we were fair. The, we, the, the student who got the first question, we, we gave her the first question in the last hour when it was their turn to ask us questions. So now, after you graduated from all school, as the Chancellor said, you had the opportunity to, I suppose, see a little behind the curtain with uh, being a clerk to two justices. And particularly, you got an opportunity to see the Supreme Court uh, with Justice Rehnquist, as he then was. What surprised you? What, what did you learn from that time? Um, well, he was, he was a brilliant jurist and a wonderful man, uh, a very unassuming. It was very easy and comfortable to be one of his uh, uh, law clerks. Um, uh, I was a little surprised. Uh, the job was much more uh, involving, again, oral exchanges. Uh, some justices and judges will have their clerks uh, prepare memoranda about you know, preparing uh, for argument in the case and all that, but with uh, Justice uh, Rehnquist, it was very much an oral uh, discussion. He expected us to be very familiar, obviously, with the record. Mm -hmm. But on a, you know, on a good day, we, he would go out and we would walk around the, the court in the neighborhood and uh, uh, talk about the issues and the, and the case. It was uh, a very fond memories of that. Quite often, since we were in the neighborhood of the court, we would be stopped by uh, tourists visiting, and they would ask us to take a picture of them in front of the court. And uh, Justice Rehnquist was always happy to oblige. And <laughs> so there are dozens of families around the country who have a beautiful picture of themselves in front of the court, and they don't know it was taken by uh, a justice of the court. 
Now, after that time you spent, uh, as the Chancellor outlined, various positions in the public sector, working the White House and, and other areas. Do you think that's useful for a federal judge to have seen things from the point of view of the government as well? Oh, sure. And, and also useful to have spent time in private practice and seen it from that perspective as, as well. It's, it's one of the good things about being a lawyer in Washington is that you can, you know, if you're interested in it, sort of go back and forth from government to the private sector. And um, you're certainly a much better private sector attorney if you've had experience on the government side and, and vice versa. It's good for, for judges to have that perspective and good for lawyers in general. And during that time in practice, uh, you became well known as a Supreme Court advocate and argued a number of very important cases. And one of the things we were talking about in the seminar is the fact that unlike in Australia, there's a very strict half hour time limit, pretty rigorously enforced, and an average of 55 questions asked of advocates during that half hour. And right. apparently in one notorious case, you were asked 120 questions uh, during a half hour period. How on earth does one prepare for that sort of role? Well. Uh, first of all, I have to admit that my reputation as an appellate advocate improved dramatically when I was nominated for the court. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember as many people saying as, as nice things as before. Um, well, I mean, obviously you have to spend a lot of time with the record uh, and be familiar with it. You have to have in mind, I think, the particular points that you think will help decide the case um, uh, and try to return to those. Uh, in, in the course of the questioning. And you do have to try to be nimble enough to re appreciate where the questioning is coming from um, uh, and why one of the justices is asking that question. And you have to be prepared to sort of move on from them. If you don't think they're going to be helpful to your case, you know, you can answer uh, quickly and then turn your attention to another justice. They don't always let you off the hook, uh, um, but it does, you know, and, you know, and when you get that many questions, you can't really be expected to have the same number of answers. So, so <laughs> fortunately, they will interrupt each other and you're allowed to move on. To, you know, so. Pick the best question and answer that. <laughs> it can be dangerous, though. I do remember one uh, exchange when Justice Stevens uh, was on the court. He'd asked me a question and I was preparing to answer it and one of the other justices interrupted, which, which, which happens with another question. And so I tried to answer that one and then I thought well, this would endear me to Justice Stevens, and I said, well, Justice Stevens, I didn't have an opportunity to answer your question. And he was beaming, it was smiling, it was great, and I'm smiling back, and I suddenly realized I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, just, just kind of mumbled something, and he had a very confused look on his face. So the answer is yes, Your Honor, <laughs> to that question. So what, what's the most memorable case that you were involved in from your time in practice? Um, well, you know, you tend to remember the ones you won. Uh, and um, uh, I guess the best, the most interesting one, it, it sounds unlikely, but it was an admiralty case, uh, involved uh, construction on the Chicago River, uh, which is really nothing more than a canal uh, running through downtown Chicago. Um, it was a barge that had been tied up to the shore for about nine, nine months. You know, it was a, a crane and they were pounding things down into the river. Um, and unbeknownst to anyone at the time, underneath the bottom of the river was this maze of tunnels that had grown up with the city. They were used for shuttling coal in and all that kind of thing. And my client, punching things down, punched a hole in the bottom of the river and into this underground maze that went throughout the, the downtown Chicago. And the water started rushing in and filling up the, the basement of Chicago. Uh, and you know, lights start going out because that's where all the cables are. And, and uh, um, the, the issue was whether or not the client was liable for the billion some dollars that were caused by shutting down the city for several days. Um, and our, our argument was there, there's an old law from the early 1800s called the Limitation of Liability Act. Stop me if this gets boring. Uh, and and uh, it's designed to promote travel uh, and trade over the high seas that says if you're involved in an accident in a boat, your liability is limited to the value of your vessel to get people to be willing to shuttle shipments of gold and all sorts of things back and forth. And the Chicago River counts as navigable water. And uh, this, this could be viewed as a boat uh, that was uh, <laughs> the barge. And so we argued that um, the liability of our client was limited to the value of the barge uh, under this act, and uh, the court saw it that way, 
Um, the, my opponent, I remember arguing that, you know, you're, you're arguing that the basement of uh, uh, Marshall Fields, which is a big department store in Chicago, counts as the high seas. And, and, uh, yes, we are. <laughs> and it did, it did. So the, there are other issues that remain complicated. We didn't get off entirely with the $4,000 value of the barge, but it was a good place to start. Well, you, you have an interesting practice, and one assumes a well-paid practice, and yet in 2003 you decide to become a judge, and that's a decision that's quite a, a difficult one for people to make often. What made you think that it was important to take up that role? Well, um, by then I had been practicing for 25 years, uh, both in government and out, and both in government in the Solicitor General's office and in private practice I've been arguing cases. Um, before the appellate courts, including the D.C. Circuit, and kind of thought it was just time for a change to see what it was like on the other side of the bench. Um, um, and I was very fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, to do it. And what was it like on the other side of the bench before you well, get to the Supreme Court? It was, um, it was hard uh, uh, at first. It, what was hard was making the adjustment. Mm -hmm. As a private lawyer, you're used to seeing the, the case and saying, okay, this is my position, I'm going to advance it, and you see things from that perspective, when you say, okay, here are all the arguments, you know, why this, you know, barge counted as a ship on the ocean and why, and, and when you get to be a judge and you go through the questions and the analyze it and you figure, okay, this is the right result. And I remember sitting down and starting to write uh, an opinion or a judgment as you call it and treating it like a brief. Okay, this is what the right result is. Here are all the reasons that, that support that. And it, it took a while to be able to step back and realize you know, you're not arguing for a result, you're explaining uh, a, a conclusion. And for example, you don't need every argument you can think of uh, in, in an opinion, but just enough to explain why you reached uh, the result. So I, I have to say it took me a little while to make that adjustment. I had the benefit of some uh, very uh, talented uh, uh, colleagues on the bench who helped me make that adjustment, and uh, I certainly appreciated their help. Now, one of the other aspects of becoming a judge, and perhaps thinking now particularly about 2005 and, and moving to the Supreme Court, that looks very foreign and a little bit challenging to Australian eyes is the confirmation process. Uh, and it's something that we've heard a number of judges from the US, uh, indeed in this law school over the last year, raise some concerns and criticisms about the way that it happens. If we could give you a, a magic wand, constitution doesn't matter, popular opinion doesn't matter, politics doesn't matter, what do you think would be the very best way of selecting justices for the United States Supreme Court? Um, well, it's an interesting question. I, you know, uh, for trial judges, um, I think I'm right. It was the, it's the Scottish system, isn't it, where they or the old one anyway, where the lawyers would elect the judge, and you thought that would guarantee the best because they'd want the best lawyer out of the competition, so they would <laughs> make uh, make him the judge. Um, I don't think that works at an appellate level or the Supreme Court level. I think the system that the, uh, the framers of our Constitution set up uh, is a very good one. I don't think it's being implemented very well uh, in practice. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the founding fathers did not intend the confirmation process to work the way it has worked. Um, you look at the most recent, well, going back in history, uh, uh, my departed colleague, Justice Scalia, I think he was confirmed unanimously. I, I, you know, maybe there was one or two or 98. But, um, uh, my current colleague, Justice Ginsburg, the same. Um, uh, and it's hard to imagine what kind of a process those individuals would have to go through today, given, you know, given their, uh, not only their ability, but their clear articulation of law, and that's going to be, uh, uh, offend somebody in the process. Um, and the most recent nominees uh, <coughs> to the Supreme Court, um, very contentious uh, uh, hearings, um, and yet they're enormously and clearly qualified and is demonstrated by how well they're doing um, on the court. The problem is that the confirmation process has become a platform for people involved to make statements and express positions on things that don't have anything to do with the qualifications of the nominees. Now, um, you know, it's the business of the Senate how they conduct their affairs, it's not mine, but I do think it's, it's having an adverse consequence um, on how people view the court. If you have this sort of horns locked, uh, hostile, 
process to decide whether this person should emerge from it and go on the court, uh, you know, the, the lay person observing it naturally assumes that that person must carry with him or her the baggage from that. And if people are fighting in a partisan way, the person must be a partisan, which of course is not, uh, not the case. Um, so I, I think it's unfortunate. I think it, uh, at some point, hopefully, people will be able to take a step back and see that it's not working the way it's intended. You do, you do emerge from that process, though, as Chief Justice. Uh, yeah, I want sometimes to, it some, works. Sometimes yeah. it works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder if you could reflect a little on the role of Chief Justice. Uh, there's, of course, a really important role for anybody who's a judge of the Supreme Court. Yeah. But what's different about the role of Chief Justice? What qualities might a Chief Justice need uh, that's distinct from that of, of the very heavy responsibilities and qualities that would be needed right. for a judge? Uh, one thing that's different, uh, you get an extra $10,000, uh, which is, you know, nothing to laugh at. Uh, uh, it's fundamentally the same as the, any other position. You get one vote, you participate in the discussions like, uh, uh, like everyone else. Um, you do have a significant number of additional administrative responsibilities around, around the, uh, the courthouse uh, and also with respect to the federal judiciary as a whole, the Chief Justice chairs what's known as the Judicial Conference, which sets policy for all of the federal courts around the country. And it's a, it's a significant amount of additional work. As far as the functioning of the Supreme Court, I think the only substantive difference is that the Chief Justice assigns the opinions. Uh, if he's in the majority, assigns the majority opinion. If he's in dissent, he'll assign the dissent. Um, and, and that's a fairly delicate responsibility. Um, at the end of a two-week sitting, uh, I sit down to make the assignments. You want to make sure at the end of the year everybody's had a fair number of, you know, the big cases along with the little ones, the interesting cases and the dull ones, cases that are unanimous, cases that are sharply divided. You want to make sure there's a mix of the substantive areas. You don't want someone just to have all the criminal cases, even if they want them. Uh, uh, and you want to make sure that even, for example, if two of my colleagues are, are sort of uh, at loggerheads, several opinions in a row, you want to make sure maybe each of them get an opinion the next time uh, where they're both on the same side and sort of let the waters settle a little. Uh, and you've got to get the work done. Uh, you know, some of my colleagues work more quickly than others. You don't want to give uh, uh, one of the slower, <coughs> excuse me, slower moving justices a big opinion in the last sitting that makes it hard uh, to get done. And you have to, most, most importantly, do it with an eye to the analysis. I mean, you may have a case that's seven to two, but in the seven that are going to be, be voting to affirm or reverse, you know, four may think one thing and three the other. Well, you've got to make sure you give the assignment to one of the four. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have people writing in a, a minority uh, 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 opinion that is not going to express the views of the whole court, and they're going to have to sort through all that. So um, uh, it's like, I don't know if people still have them, the old Rubik's Cubes. You know, as soon as you get everything lined up right on one side, okay, everyone has a good mix of unanimous, not unanimous. Then you look and, no, no, it's not, everyone's, so-and-so's writing just constitutional cases. So you have to switch that around and that. So, you know, it's kind of um, satisfying at the end of its, a Friday, at the end of that Friday, if everything fits together well. Um, I remember doing that one time when I finally got everything organized and was ready to go, and then I realized, oh no, I thought so-and-so voted this way in the case and he voted the other way. It, it, rather than trying to readjust everything, it was worth a phone call to ask her if she could change her vote. But <laughs> it, it, it didn't work, but you know, no harm. No harm in asking. Well, perhaps moving then on to, to some of the substantive issues that the court deals with and, and understanding, of course, and this will be important for question time, we won't talk about particular cases. Uh, but Australia doesn't have a Bill of Rights in its constitution, as you'd know, and the US has probably the most famous Bill of Rights in its constitution mm -hmm. in the world, and, and your court is regularly engaged with it. Now, in Australia, every now and then we go through a debate about whether we should have a Bill of Rights. Right. Uh, and people look at the US example with, with somewhat mixed feelings, and, and some who are critics of, Bill of Bills of Rights would say, these are really political or moral questions which are not being responded to legally, but judges are just bringing their own personal, political or moral views to answering them, we should stick with a, a more democratic method of resolving those tensions. From the experience you've had as a, as a judge, as an advocate, as a citizen, what sort of response would you have to some of those concerns? Um, well, 
uh, and first of all, I don't by any means mean to participate in the debate here. I'm not, that would be presumptuous uh, and uninformed. But um, in our system, yes, uh, judges do have a great deal of leeway in interpreting the provisions of the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, and it's a debate among judges uh, whether they're going too far or, or, or not. Um, but I would have thought uh, that a written Bill of Rights uh, has a limiting effect on how free judges feel they can be in applying uh, their, uh, the particular provisions. Um, we begin with the constitutional text uh, when we're analyzing a question under the Bill of Rights, and in many cases, it, it has determinative uh, uh, weight. Um, it also, even if it doesn't, it does sort of lay out the map about how you're supposed to address the particular question uh, uh, in, at issue. So I don't know that putting things in writing would have the consequence of allowing judges greater license uh, to uh, introduce their personal preferences, which of course uh, they, they should and, and do try to, uh, try to avoid. Um, I think it's more a question of what the established jurisprudence is in terms of the flexibility and uh, what type of provision you're you're looking at, and that is the basic question of how to go about interpreting it, that yes, the Fourth Amendment says there's no unreasonable uh, searches. Well, what does that mean? If you just ask the judge, what do you think? What do you think is reasonable? That's obviously too much uh, discretion to the judge, but if you say you know that that word meant something when the framers adopted it, well, what did it mean? Uh, uh, and how has that word been interpreted and developed over, over the centuries? Those are the kinds of things that confine uh, uh, judges and prevent them from being able to introduce personal preferences into the interpretation of the Bill of Rights. Um, and I, I suspect when you're dealing with uh, liberties that are protected under an unwritten constitution, an un unwritten Bill of Rights, those are the same sorts of considerations that judges would take into account. Well, another area in which perhaps the approach in Australia and the United States does differ somewhat is with respect to the use of foreign judgments when addressing constitutional cases. That's quite a regular occurrence in Australia, including mm -hmm. references to the judgments of your own court, the opinions of your own court, uh, more controversial in the United States. Is there a place for looking at foreign judgments when coming to constitutional issues? Yes. Um, you know, the issue is one that people think is more controversial than it is. It's often misunderstood. Um, uh, if we have a judgment, an opinion from a sister court uh, somewhere around the world that is similar to an issue before us, uh, of course uh, we look to what uh, that court has had to say, see if we can benefit from uh, the analysis. Uh, obviously, you know, changing it to the appropriate situation in our country as opposed to the other, but we're, we're very, very open to whatever benefit there can be uh, in terms of the analysis of, of the particular question. The area that becomes difficult for us is uh, looking to foreign judgments to give not uh, guidance to how we would interpret or analyze a particular question, but to have a substantive effect on the actual analysis. It comes up most frequently uh, in the area of capital punishment, for example, where uh, under some analyses, our uh, uh, interpretation of the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishments uh, will, will derive, uh, in some justices' view, content from what other countries have to say about it. In other words, a, a court in another country will say that this constitutes a, a, a what would, we would call cruel and unusual punishment. And then that is looked to not for the value of the analysis, uh, but as a substantive data point saying, well, it probably is cruel and unusual punishment under our constitution because another court thinks it is. Uh, and that's where the controversy comes in. So whether or not the content of our actual constitutional provision should be shaped by uh, foreign judgments, uh, and there is considerable disagreement about that. But as far as getting benefit from the work of judges of other countries, we're very, very open to that and very welcome when we find uh, uh, that another court has dealt with the same type of issue. Well, in dealing with some of these complicated issues, one of, one of the interesting points is who is on the court, and one of the issues that you've raised is that we now have very much a lawyer's Supreme Court, people have been practicing lawyers, judges, mainly federal judges, uh, now Supreme Court judges. Mm -hmm. Of course, historically, that hasn't always been the case in the United States with a lot of people who'd had experience in politics and been actively engaged in politics. 
Is there perhaps a mismatch between the very legal background that people are bringing to the court and, and perhaps some of the big political and moral controversies that the court deals with, or is that in fact a, a useful thing to have a more legal lens to be looking at these issues? Um, the short answer is I don't know, but I do think it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. In the seminar, we studied uh, closely the court's decision in Brown versus mm -hmm. Board of Education, and it's very interesting when you look at the court that rendered that decision. Of course, the Chief Justice is uh, Earl Warren, uh, who when he was appointed had been a candidate for vice president, three-time governor of uh, uh, California, um, uh, a few senators on that court, a few attorneys general, uh, uh, Professor Felix Frankfurter and others, um, not intermediate federal judges. Um, when Justice Alito was confirmed uh, to the court uh, uh, on which I served six months later, every single one of the justices had been promoted from being an intermediate federal judge. That's a very different mm. personnel uh, uh, addressing these issues. Uh, and yet the constitutional issues that we are asked to resolve are of a similar order of uh, social and political significance as the issue in Brown versus Board of Education. So um, I don't quite know what the answer is, but, I, but things have changed. It, the, the issues are pretty much the same. The court that's deciding those issues is uh, very different. Um, uh, I do think it's something worth thinking about whether, um, uh, well, why is that? Why do we not have uh, uh, people of the political stature of uh, Earl Warren and Hugo Black and other people on the court today uh, and instead have, um, with respect to my colleagues, very talented uh, lawyers? Um, it seems to me that you don't want a court that is simply replicates the political structure in the rest of the government. You're going to have, uh, I think it's good that a court be consists of individuals who are good lawyers. Um, but that may say something about the kind of issues they should be addressing as a general matter. Uh, if you're going to resolve, are these issues that should be resolved uh, in legal terms as a matter of law? Or should they be resolved in some other way? If they should be resolved in some way other than simply as legal questions, well maybe they should be resolved by somebody else other than very good lawyers. We're looking back over the history of the court, as, as I know, something you're very interested in doing. As you say, a very wide array of people with quite different backgrounds. Is there anyone you particularly admire, look to for inspiration in your current role, acknowledging that the times are different now, but that you find the sort of principles or values that you admire? Uh, well, yes, and, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's an easy question, at least for me, and I think it would be an easy question for almost anybody in my position. Uh, the great Chief Justice, John Marshall, uh, uh, is uh, a, a a very good model in a number of respects in terms of the way he uh, managed the court to the extent a chief justice can manage uh, the court in a very open way uh, uh, with his, uh, his colleagues and appreciation for their views. Um, during his tenure, most of the decisions of the court uh, were unanimous um, uh, and not because, if the history will demonstrate, not because the other associate justices just deferred uh, to whatever he wanted to do, although that might not be a bad thing, uh, but, uh, uh, but because he was very open to their views and he would come to some general agreement and people felt very much that they were part of the, uh, uh, part of the process. Uh, uh, he was brilliant, he was uh, personable, he was uh, hardworking, he had a very good sense and perspective about what the uh, role of the court was. Like so many of our founding fathers and we lose sight of the fact, you know, he was uh, a war hero in the War of Independence and was heavily invested in ensuring that the experiment of American democracy uh, succeeded. Uh, uh, and he, he was a, a, a great writer. It wasn't until the late 19th century that lawyers for some reason felt they had to write in an impenetrable manner and use all sorts of whereas and heretofores. You can pick up his great masterpiece, Marbury versus Madison, and, and read it and understand what, what, is, uh, what is going on. So he's certainly somebody you would want uh, to look to as a role model, uh, uh, and not in the sense that, oh, I want to, I'm going to be like that, uh, but uh, someone um, who has a lot to uh, uh, show you about how the job should be done. Wonderful. Well, we might take this opportunity to turn it over to the audience now. Uh, people 
could raise their hand if they have a question to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask you to say your, wait till you have the microphone, say your name, uh, an institution that you're associated with. We're then looking for questions, not speeches, judgments, uh, <laughs> life biographies. Uh, and uh, while the Chief Justice is capable of answering apparently 120 questions in half an hour, I uh, will take <laughs> a small collection to start with and we'll start here with Jennifer Petruni. Uh, down the front here, please. Uh, sorry, could you just wait for the microphone because we're... We're live streaming. Chief Justice Jennifer Petruni, I'm President of the Victorian Bar. Um, thank you very much for your talk today. Um, both in your country and in ours, we have had recent instances of politicians criticising the judiciary. Is that ever okay or will it always undermine the rule of law? Well, uh, we're certainly not above uh, Criticism, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, as we'd like to say, it's a free country and, and people who don't like what we do are free to say that they don't, that they don't like what we do. Um, it certainly doesn't affect how we go about uh, our, our job. Um, uh, the founding fathers, uh, in their wisdom, gave us life tenure uh, and protection against uh, diminution in our salary. And uh, uh, that is a very liberating uh, uh, feature of the Constitution. So uh, judges go about doing their job with their attention to uh, uh, what they, they should be doing and are not uh, uh, swayed by uh, criticism, uh, not dissuaded from doing their job uh, by, by criticism. Oh, come on, really. <laughs> so. Somebody in the middle there? Hi, my name's Emily Rothfield. Um, I'm a former editor of the Melbourne University Law Review and I'm currently in private practice at Allens. Um, when I was editor, we published an article on judges and retirement ages. In Australia, we have a retirement age of 70 in the high court and various retirement ages in the lower courts. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, given that you have a life appointment? Well, I think uh, the life appointment's better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate that it, it that our system is probably the minority. I think most uh, collegial courts have uh, retirement ages, uh, and I certainly understand uh, uh, why and the value of them. You know, uh, I guess anecdotally, I look at on my own court. If it was a retirement age of seventy, we'd lose very very valuable uh, jurists. Um, I look at someone like Justice Stevens, who served. Uh, uh, well beyond that retirement age and was uh, uh, active and uh, uh, contributing in, in very, very significant ways up until the time that he, that he left. Um, I, I don't, um, one thing I don't like about retirement ages um, uh, is that they're, they're predictable. You know that Justice so-and-so is not going to be leaving the court in six months, in, in a year, whatever. Um, uh, and that might cause people to, you know, affect how they go about raising particular issues or um, uh, something like that. While there, there's a benefit in the uncertainty that um, uh, you don't know when people are going to be leaving or, or, or not, and, and you can't really shape arguments or, or look ahead to that eventuality. Um, having said that, I certainly understand the benefit of, uh, of retirement ages and sort of like getting a you know, a healthy turnover and all that. But um, um, I, I like the way it works now. And I understand it may be very different. It may be different in different systems depending upon the nature of the cases that come before the court. Uh, when people are going to be leaving and all that uh, uh, may or may not have the kind of significance uh, uh, for other courts as it does for, uh, for, for different ones. But I, I like the current, uh, current system. And I, uh, but I appreciate that most courts run on a different uh, uh, run differently. 
Cathy Walter, Chief Justice, um, a former editor of the Law Review, though many years before you, <laughs> and delighted to be a member of the Melbourne Law School Foundation Board. I wanted to take you to the business of, in the one case, being counsel in front of the court, or in the other case, being a justice with counsel in front of the court, and the correlation between the questions asked by the justice and the reasons then that emerge for the opinion. Is there a sense when you've been the counsel that the questions correlated with an outcome you expected from the particular justice? And when you look at your brother-sister justices, are the questions they're asking reflected in the way they come to their opinions in due course? You know, I think it's very hard to generalise because one of the things that's uh, interesting, and I really wasn't quite aware of it until I became a judge, um, but I do think it's a, a tradition in courts that derive from the uh, English model. We don't talk about cases prior to the arguments, um, uh, you know, with rare exceptions, but as a general matter. So at the argument, that is the first time we get a sense of what our colleagues think. Um, uh, and that tends to cause you to look at the questions perhaps in a little different way. So for example, uh, if you had viewed a case in a particular way and you find out one of your colleagues has a problem with that and you think there are good answers to that, of course, you can't just turn over and you know, whisper in her ear that this is what the answer is. But you can ask the lawyer the question and elicit from the lawyer you know, the answers that you think will satisfy uh, your colleague. Um, so when you're pressing the lawyer on that question, it, it, it's not because you think there's a problem with his case, it's because you think there is not a problem on that issue and you want that lawyer to make it clear to your, your, your friend that uh, that's not something she should be uh, concerned about. So why people are asking questions, it, 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 there's so many different reasons. Um, uh, it may be, uh, as a devil's advocate, to get out answers that you think are good. It may be because you don't think there are good answers. So uh, uh, the correlation about types of questions and ultimate result, I think, can be very, very difficult to pin down. Um, I'm not sure my view is supported by empirical studies. I think there's some research out there that may say if you ask more questions of you know, side A than side B, then you're going to vote in favor of side A. But I, I don't think you can easily generalize across uh, uh, every case. Um, the one thing I do know is that it's a very exciting and a very dynamic process because you've got to be paying attention to what your colleagues think because you're learning that for the first time. The lawyers have things they want to say and are trying to get out. Um, the only thing I don't like about, uh, I think it is probably the only thing I don't like about being the Chief Justice, is that part of my responsibility in such a, uh, with such a hot bench is to make sure things are fair. If one of my colleagues has been asking all of the questions for, for a significant amount of time and I know somebody else is trying to get a question in, I have to try to you know, move uh, uh, the discussion over to my colleague who's been trying desperately to get a question in. Um, the result is I don't have as much time to ask my own questions as I would like. But. We've got time. This lady in the middle. Good evening, um, Your Honour. My name's Peggy, uh, Peggy Gusa. I'm a first year JD student, so uh, very new to the law. <laughs> How is it going so far? Really well, really like it. Yeah, thanks. You were my lecturer last semester. <laughs> um, um, I just wanted to ask, Your Honour, um, with the appointment of uh, Justice Sotomayor, there was a lot of discussion of uh, the benefit of uh, diversity within um, the Supreme Court um, in terms of the administration of justice, especially in a country as diverse as America. Um, and you've hinted in your discussion this evening about the, the having a distinction between um, a legal answer for something and perhaps some issues that don't, um, shouldn't be answered in a legal way, but perhaps in another avenue, like a political, um, the political realm. And I was wondering, to what extent do you think diversity within the actual makeup of the Supreme Court is beneficial to the administration of justice, and to what extent do you think it disadvantages it? I think that uh, diversity is very important in the, uh, uh, a court like ours, a collegial court, where you're trying to reach a decision based on input from a lot of different people. Um, I do think sometimes people have too narrow an understanding of diversity. One area uh, where I know that Justice Sotomayor has had a significant contribution is that she was 
uh, uh, after a long absence, uh, the first member of the court that had experience as a trial judge. Um, that is something that comes up quite often. We're dealing with trial records, um, and uh, uh, she had uh, considerable has had considerable experience in the trial process, um, and has offered and regularly does significant and important insights into how a record uh, that we're looking at, it's a printed record, this is what happened in the trial, but she gives insight into well, what was actually going on behind the, those printed pages. And that's a, an extremely important uh, uh, contribution um, uh, in a very practical and pragmatic way. Uh, judges, um, uh, their view of the law and their legal conclusions uh, shouldn't vary uh, depending upon uh, uh, their, their uh, uh, personalities, their ethnic background, uh, their geographic background. There is, of course, a reality that our views are shaped by who we are, and I do think that's important to take into account. But courts are not representative bodies. We shouldn't look to them and say, you know, you, you, you represent this country, this entity, and so you must, uh, in an in individual way, reflect uh, the identities of that country. That's not what courts are supposed to be doing. And if they are, um, you know, you do have to wonder about the, uh, the process. Uh, it is at the same time, of course, true that our views and how we see things are shaped by our own experiences. And I do think it's important uh, that, that we have diversity in the courts to reflect that. Um, there are ways in which our court is, is extremely diverse and there are ways in which it is not. It is, to me, um, Amazing that uh, all the members went to, you know, two law schools. That, that, it's hard to imagine uh, uh, why that would be, and you think, well, that may not be a very good thing. It's kind of hard to articulate why it's not. Uh, uh, but it, I certainly would understand the notion that well, surely there must be good lawyers at places other than Harvard or Yale, um, uh, and, and you know, hopefully we can find them at some point. Uh, but. Uh, but, but I, I think the diversity of the sort I was talking about with Justice Sotomayor, uh, uh, I think it's easier to understand how that is, is helpful uh, uh, because it is part of the legal process and she brought a new perspective in that uh, regard. When you talk about other types of diversity, it's just kind of hard to understand or articulate beyond saying, you know, uh, how we see things depends upon where we're from and who we are, uh, but how that translates into different views about the law, it, it's frankly hard to put a, for, put a handle on that, I think. Let's take one more question. Just... Hello, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that your decision um, um, uh, uh, deemed the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare constitutional. Are you able to expand on um, your reasoning behind that decision? Well, that's one I have a quick answer to, I'm afraid, and that's no. Uh, for, for a very important reason, um, that, which is that uh, one, uh, uh, one, once we write an opinion or, as I said, a judgment you have here, it has to speak for itself. Um, I could tell you, well, this is you know, what I meant or this is how I was saying it, this is what I had in mind, but the opinion that's written on the page speaks for itself. It is what other judges look to, it's what lawyers look to. Um, we do our best to put the reasoning in that we think is correct, uh, uh, but it, once we do, we it sort of push it out of the nest, it's on its own. Um, uh, it wouldn't be a good thing for judges to be able to go back and say, you know, the way they're applying that, that's not what I had in mind. You know, what I meant was this. And then people will say, well, the opinion says this, but you know, Chief Justice Roberts says he meant this, so we're going to go with what he meant. No, you go with what the opinion says, and you, we do our best to try to spell it out, and that, but that's, it's got to be an objective tool that everybody in the profession uh, uh, can work from. Um, so again, the answer to your question is no, I can't. Well, perhaps I can finish off then. with a We've talked about the past. Let's talk about the future. A lot of people see even today, a rapidly changing legal profession, the impacts of technology and social changes and changing place of law. What impact do you see over the next 10 years of some of these changes, both for lawyers and, and potentially also therefore for the court? Um, well, I do think, as in every other area of society, that the uh, uh, te 
technological changes, if that's the right word, are going to have a dramatic impact uh, on the law. Uh, they already have. When I graduated from law school, uh, it was an important skill for a lawyer to be able to find the law. You know, if you were particularly good at using those thick, dusty digests, and you find that's not quite what it's about, but you can put it all together, and then you find the case. I found the case, this case from the Supreme Court of Indiana that lays it all out. And other lawyers may not be able to find it, or it might take them longer. But now, anybody here, you push one button, and you've got every case that's ever been decided under a particular statute. Finding the law is not an important skill. Now, now the skill is well. How do you, how do you distill all that? Uh, uh, you've got you know the good news is you've got every case that cited the statutory provision you're interested in. The bad news is there are 1,200 of them, uh, and it's a different skill really to sort uh, uh, through that. Um, uh, so the technology is going to change things dramatically, not only at the appellate level but at uh, the trial level and the forensic level. Um, I, I was at the judicial conference for the District of Columbia Circuit recently, my old, uh, my old court, and there were presentations about uh, forensics. And the things they can do, uh, or on the verge of doing, are really amazing. They can, for example, th through your brain. I mean, as, as it was put, it used to be that we tried to uh, uh, get at what people were thinking by trying to fix a car's engine without being able to open the hood. Mm -hmm. But now they can open the hood. They can say, see, for example, uh, by wiring your brain in a particular way and showing you a, a face, whether, whether you've seen that face before or not. Just the way your brain responds to it, saying, yes, I've seen that, uh, or no, I haven't, and they can see that. Well, that changes a lot of you know, criminal investigative mm -hmm. methods. Uh, in other words, things that we, you would think about as you know, lie detectors, except they're, they're un unreliable, but these things, you know, who knows, but they're telling you they are, they are extremely reliable. It's going to change uh, criminal investigations and presumably criminal practice uh, to uh, a, large, uh, uh, a large extent. So, uh, and it changes the law too in terms of uh, whether you're talking about well, First Amendment issues, how, are they, how does the First Amendment apply to the internet, whether that's different than the, the public square or uh, ec uh, uh, economically. Uh, so many uh, single devices are choke points in a computer. Uh, how does that work with respect to the antitrust laws? Um, uh, the technology is going to change the law dramatically, uh, and I think people have to be as nimble and adept as, uh, in understanding what, how those changes impact the fundamental principles behind uh, the law uh, in order to keep up. And that perhaps brings me then to my last question. Of course, we have many law students and recent law graduates here tonight facing a somewhat more uncertain future, but what advice do you have for those coming into the profession or, or about to come into the profession in the next couple of years? Oh, um, I don't know that I'm anybody with any particular insights uh, in, into that. Uh, other than I will say uh, that I think at least when I was going into law school, a lot of people went to law school because they couldn't figure out what else to do. Um, I, I suppose it was true in my case. Uh, fortunately, it turned out when I got there that I really, uh, really liked it. Uh, at least in the United States, I think a lot of people get out of law school uh, and w one of two things might happen. Uh, they never really wanted to be a lawyer and so they're going to be unhappy uh, at it. Uh, or they, they don't remember why they went to law school. They're doing something else. You know, if you went to law school because you wanted, you thought that was a good way to promote uh, environmental justice and that was very important to you. You should keep that in mind when you get out of law school, as opposed to going down different career paths that aren't going to allow you to do uh, what you wanted to become a lawyer to be able to do. Um, no, it's hard. Yeah, you know, the the, uh, the job in the env environmental area may not provide as much compensation as another job, and you people you need uh, to, you have responsibilities other than simply. Uh, being satisfied in your job. But uh, there are too many unhappy lawyers, uh, uh, again, at least in the United States, and it's because they forget why they went to law school in the first place, or they don't sit back and say, well, maybe I shouldn't have gone to law school. But I if you're going to make it a career, uh, make sure it's something you're really committed to, and then, you know, it should be a good choice. Well, it's a wonderful note on which to finish. You've been very generous with your time and your insights. Could I please call on former Dean of the Law School, Professor Michael Cromlin, to offer a vote of thanks on behalf of everybody tonight.
Thank you, Carolyn. Chief Justice, Chancellor, Dean, distinguished guests, one and all. As you know, it's been a big week in the law school. First, with the remarkable seminar series on the Supreme Court of the United States in historical perspective, and now the James Merrill's lecture. The seminar on the Supreme Court demonstrated how in the space of just over 200 years, the court evolved from a weak, fragile, almost insignificant component of the federal system of government in the United States to the robust, resilient, respected body that it is today. One of the uh, significant elements of that remarkable evolution is that the Supreme Court has the constitutional responsibility now unchallenged for determining the limits of power of governments, federal and state, and of their branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. This is always a challenging task, especially so in times of political upheaval and crisis when inevitably it becomes mired in controversy. It's surprising to us, perhaps, that there have been only 16 Chief Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States, several of whom made outstanding contributions to the evolution of the court, beginning notably, of course, with John Marshall, to whom the Chief Justice already referred tonight, John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice who held that office for an amazing 34 years from 1900 and one to 1935. The course provided a penetrating and intriguing analysis of these contributions by Chief Justices. And as Carolyn's already uh, mentioned, it's of course no surprise that that uh, analysis concluded with William H. Rehnquist, the 15th Chief Justice who served for almost 19 years from 1986 to 2005, and the immediate predecessor of Chief Justice Roberts. Tonight's conversation brings us up to the present and hence adds significantly to the seminar. The 16th Chief Justice has provided us with his personal and highly informative reflections on his legal career generally, remarkable legal career, but particularly on the 12 years since his appointment as Chief Justice. In doing so, he's alluded, uh, perhaps with excessive modesty, to the scope for and significance of leadership of the court at a time when the United States is, once again, embroiled in political upheaval and crisis. Chief Justice, we're most grateful for these frank and instructive insights. But that's not all. We're also reminded tonight that the High Court of Australia stands in a rather similar position to that of the Supreme Court of the United States. It too determines the limits of power of Commonwealth state and territory governments under our constitution, as well as the limits of power of their three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The framers of our constitution drew heavily on the experience of the Supreme Court of the United States in drafting our chapter three. Since then, the High Court has often derived benefit from that experience, and it continues to do so today in difficult political times in Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in conveying our warmest appreciation to the Honourable John G. Roberts, Jr., the 16th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, both for his visit to the Melbourne Law School this week and especially for this most engaging and stimulating James Merrill's lecture. Thank you. 